record. Good morning. It is Wednesday, August 25, week four. Uh, next week is week five and midterms and midterm grades. This is MED 210. Um, and uh, what is due today, of course, um, task three, discussion three, lesson three, due by now, 9 a.m. Now, next week, the only thing that's due is task four. Do not, and I repeat, do not do discussion four. Do not do the case study in lesson four. Your goal for next week is to ace this exam. Instead of a lesson four discussion four grade, you will have, uh, uh, I'll put the midterm grade in there and uh, adjust some things so that your midterm exam will equal 10%. So the only thing due next week is task four, and you should be studying for uh, next week's exam anyway. So the scope of the exam, 50 items, multiple choice, and it'll be on, um, I believe it's September 1, uh, is next Wednesday, and it'll be 9 a.m. promptly. At uh, 8.55 or so, I'm going to put in announcements, your exam, so you don't have to log into Zoom. Um, uh, I'll be monitoring my email and my text messaging that morning, uh, just in case there are any technical difficulties, but there'll be a Microsoft Word document. That'll be the exam. And the only thing that you will be sending me is an email. And in that email, it's going to be like this. Of course, you send the email to ngarias at stratford.edu. And of course, you'll have your name. In the body of the email, that's it, just your name. Uh, and of course, uh, MED 210, um, midterm exam. And then you'll number one to 50, all the way down to 50. And then you'll just have your answers. A, B. And that's all I need. I Please do not send anything else. Don't send a picture of your printed exam. Don't send the, uh, again, I have to reiterate, do not send pictures. Do not send Microsoft Word documents. Do not send the questionnaire with the answers highlighted. Uh, points will be taken off. It goes for failure to listen to instructions. And all of these things that I'm telling you will be on announcements for next week. The exam is again, 50 items, multiple choice. The scope is week one through four. Any topics that we discussed week one through four and um, the exam will officially start at 9 a.m. and will officially end at 10, 15 a.m. Once I receive uh, uh, your email to uh, my, my official Stratford email account, this one right here, I will reply to you that I received it, that I, that I see everything. And please don't leave answers blank. Make sure that all the answers match up to what you want to answer for the midterm exam for next week. There's always one. There's always one student who skips and then forgets, and then it shifts all their answers. And that's how you can, that's how you can fail your exam. So please, attention to detail. Many of you are future nurses. All of you are healthcare. So please, please, please pay attention to detail and uh, rewind this video for all the explanation, but there will be also in announcements for next week, uh, specific instructions on what to do. And it'll mirror all the things that I've said uh, right now. So do, do either of you have any questions on how next week is gonna go down? Please do not go to campus. Do you believe there's people still going to campus when the professor clearly stated like uh, the days that they're gonna have Zoom? I was on campus yesterday and there's people walking around and I'm telling you, gang, I don't care how, what kind of grades you have. If you can't listen to basic, basic instructions, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but there's always one in the crowd. Now, it, for, for now, this is just education. It's annoying. But when you're in the ward and you can't get basic instructions down, it could cost something like someone else's life, like your career, a whole bunch of things. Right. Um, I always shared with you guys my great one of my greatest boo boos that I ever did as a physician is I forgot my left from my right. 
so what I'm tired. So I go, uh, so what everyone's tired. Everyone has things going on. You have to pay attention. Okay. And the scope again is all the topics from week one, two, three, and four. So this week, what are we doing this week? The topic for this week is uh, kidney. Okay. And it not only makes urine, which is uh, our waste product. And I want you to start thinking about waste as simply, it's not like a bad thing. It's just simply excess things that your body doesn't need. Your body is highly efficient and it doesn't need, it doesn't, if it has too much, it gets rid of it. Like for example, I drink too much water, I'm going to urinate it out, right? There's extra substances in my blood, for example, salt or sugar. I'm going to, because it's going to end up in the toilet and I have to excrete them or uh, remove them. And urine is one way. And it's just one of several functions um, um, in the human kidney and um, basic nephrology. We're going to be talking about what is urine, what's it made out of, some basic, basic things. Um, how does, how do we make urine? And, uh, of course, all the structures of the kidney, both inside and out, and the other functions that I mentioned, because, um, excretion or creation of urine, um, uh, filtration of waste products is just one of several things that, uh, the kidney does. So it's chapter 25, um, here in, uh, task four, of course, this is uh, the only thing that you're submitting for next week. So, so you can focus on studying for this exam. Uh, if you look at this urinary physiology lab, of course, don't do it. But lovely, lovely notes. Quick notes. Okay. Oh, they also have quick notes regarding um, uh, um, urinalysis, which is, is nice. And But uh, we'll uh, describe this. Uh, momentarily when we go through the chapter. So let's jump right in. Do, do, do. Textbook, open stacks. I believe is chapter 25. Two, four, 25. So right off the bat, and when you're making your uh, concept map, you see how it kind of helps you? Look, you could write kidney as your center one, and you have all these things. And then for each one, list what's the most important things for each one. And if you can do that, then you can, the next step would be, okay, how could he ask that in an exam? Okay. So right off the bat, I could ask you about the characteristics of urine because we got to know what is urine. Well, it's uh, excess water and excess um, waste products um, um, that uh, from our blood that the kidney takes out and um, puts it in the toilet. The color anywhere from pale yellow to deep amber. The odor. Now, they say it's odorless. Uh, but in your clinical classes, they're going to say the word, well, urine isn't odorless. You smell it. it. smells like urine. And the smells like urine, like normal urine, you know what normal urine smells like. Clinically, it's called aromatic, meaning it smells like urine. Okay. But there, you'll learn in your pathology classes that there are abnormal smells to urine. For example, uncontrolled diabetic, it's, there's going to be a trace um, and it's called fruity. It's not really fruit. It's like um, nail polish, like acetone, but it's not super strong. It's just very, very faint. You could also have in some uh, muscular disorders and metabolic disorders, it's mousy. And uh, if any of you had a gerbil or know what a mouse smells like, it smells like, I don't know, like kind of wet, wet old cardboard. Um, maple syrup, uh, that's also another metabolic uh, disorder. You're going to have a, a, a sweet, tra uh, sweet um, trace uh, smell in the urine. So the odor for urine is called aromatic. The volume, it's variable. Anything under like three quarters of a liter to, to even two liters. 
if you uh, 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 if you're drinking a lot. The pH could be slightly acidic, slightly basic, and um, in pharmacology, when we have certain medications, we play around with that um, so we can uh, excrete or remove certain uh, substances. Uh, you might hear the word the acidification of urine or uh, making the urine uh, alkaline. Remember, your pH meter is from 1 to 14. 7 is where human beings should be, right, in general. And anything left to the 7, acidic. Anything right to the uh, right of 7, basic. Now, specific gravity. If you look at this, specific gravity of water is 1.000. So urine shouldn't have a lot of things in it. That's what this specific gravity means. It means like how heavy is the, um, is the urine compared to water? Now, if I'm throwing out all these things below, uh, excess protein, excess uh, ketones, nitrites, and all these other things, then this number is gonna get high. And then that's gonna signal to us there are things in our urine that shouldn't be there. Osmolarity is uh, the amount of, uh, for those of you who haven't had chemistry yet, it's just the amount of solute that's inside. And there's not a lot, milliosmoles per kilogram, it's tiny. Uh, and the specific gravity also is an indication of that. So the majority of what you're throwing out is water. So right off the bat, before we even get to the functions of urine, we already know that urine filters blood. The next thing we now know is urine also gets rid of our excess water. So it has a lot to do with our water homeostasis as well. And if it has a lot to do with our water homeostasis, it also has a lot to do with our blood pressure, controlling our blood pressure. Because controlling our blood pressure control water and control the salts. Um, and you learn way more about that in pharmacology, especially when we're dealing with um, hypertension medical management. White blood, white blood cells, there shouldn't be any white blood cells. Leukocyte esterase is um, uh, an enzyme uh, um, that deals with your white blood cells, you should have no white blood cells. You shouldn't have any protein. You shouldn't have any blood. You shouldn't have any glucose. Now, this is the rule that I always remember. Anything that's worth keeping, why would you throw it out? Like white blood cells. I need those. If I have too many, then it'll end up in my urine, like, uh, for example, like a UTI, or a kidney infection. Same thing, proteins. If I have a whole bunch of proteins in my urine, there's something wrong with my kidney or uh, like if it's Benz Jones proteins, um, sometimes it's a marker for cancer. You shouldn't have blood, blood's important. Glucose is also important. So if you're a, an, um, if you're a diabetic, uh, especially uncontrolled diabetic and you start having way too much glucose, your body's going to throw that out because it's, I don't need it. I don't need all that extra glucose and all that extra glucose is called splay S P L A Y. And once you have splay in your urine or glucose in your urine, something's wrong. There's way too much uh, glucose in your blood. And if you look at and look and think about your analysis, the urinalysis should match whatever blood work. That's why I find it very interesting since my training is internal medicine. I find it very interesting that nowadays, especially for cost cutting and things of that matter, uh, people don't do urinalysis and the blood work. They, sometimes they just do one and not the other. Um, my training states that you should do both and you should see both, especially if there's a problem with your kidneys. Now, nitrites or nitrogenous wastes, um, uh, you, you shouldn't have these. Um, because they're already built in uh, the urine in the form of ammonia. So that means there's a metabolic problem. Your body's not breaking down things normally. And ketones, um, I'm not sure if we talked about ketones yet, but, um, oh, no, you should have, because wait a minute, I keep on forgetting. This is anatomy and physiology too. Uh, how's this question for you guys? What are ketones? You guys had anatomy and physiology one? What's a ketone? Where do I get a ketone from? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And this is what I always talk about. Because just because you aced a class before, you mean, it means you have to retain it, 
right? And that's rough because we got a life and uh, I'm just trying to survive in, in my class. Um, I, I feel you guys. I'm in the same boat. But the one thing you always have to do is always go back. So anyone know what a ketotic diet is or uh, ketone bodies? No? Did I ever tell do, do did I ever give you the analogy? You're not hung, you're not you when you're hungry. You know those uh, snicker bar commercials? Hello? Hello? Is this thing on? You guys can unmute yourselves, only two of you. Do you remember that commercial? Like you're not you when you're hungry? Ms. Reynolds, do you have your mic on? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been so hungry that you don't know your name? Uh close to that. Yeah, like like when you haven't eaten for a while, don't you get weird? When yeah. That, that's true, right? And I always tell this story. One day we were out on patrol. We had a new second lieutenant. Boy genius and uh, didn't bring extra batteries for the GPS. So we got lost. When you get lost, your, your ride that picks you up, especially in a combat zone, will not hang out and wait for you because they don't want to get shot down. So they leave. Problem was we were four days out and we only had enough food and gear for like overnight. So what happened? We had to walk home. Now here's the problem in a combat zone. Do you walk home straight? No, you don't want to get killed. So you got to like kind of only move at night, stay off the road. It took four, four and a half days to get back to, um, uh, to get back to uh, the little base or whatever where, where we were at well what happens when you don't eat for three days well instead of your body breaking down fat to make glucose after 14 hours 15 hours or so you get in a starvation state and instead of fat breaking down into glucose fat breaks down into ketones ketones are a wonderful substitute for glucose but it's only good if it's temporary if it's like gets long, like days, ketones are um, neurotoxic. That means it'll start messing with your brain. And we were like, half of us were really silly. And then all of um, and on the third day, there was like a piece of, I don't know, a piece of wrapper that was in my rucksack. And another Marine thought, hey, Nelson's hoarding food. And I said, excuse me? And he goes, I'm not doing nothing. And he goes, what's that? And I go, it's a wrapper. Oh, that means you're, you're hiding food. Because the first day when we knew we were in trouble, we got all, all our food in, you know, in the middle of the campsite. And then we started, we started rationing it, you know? And this guy accused me, and I don't even remember his name. This guy accused me of it. Well, uh, push came to shove, both knives came out. And we tried to stab each other. Over what? A rapper. To this day, I barely remember it. And when we were back in the infirmary, when we got back, they put an IV in us because uh, we had exposure. And oh, by the way, this is in the Ukraine in the 80s in the winter. If you guys know anything about that part of Europe, it, it's ridiculously cold. So we uh, were all in the infirmary for a couple of days. And the guy said, came up to me a couple of days later. He's like, did I try to stab you? And I go, not that I know of. And he goes, oh, well, the other buddies in my rifle company said that you and I got into a fight. And then, then I felt my jaw and I felt my, then I took a good look. And he had bruises on his face. I had it on mine. And I'm like, and then I looked at my ruck. Where's my knife? They took it away from me because I tried to stab somebody with it. All because of what? Ketones. You're not you when you're hungry. Now, let's apply this to diabetes. Let's apply this to normal human beings, not this extreme situation, okay? What happens when you guys do starvation diets, also known as ketotic diets? Maybe you guys heard of that, you know, um, um, like Atkins. When Atkins came out in the 90s, I was in medical school. And as a chemist, of course, I read his book. And I was not even three chapters in when I thought, are you insane? You want to put a person, a normal person in a ketotic state. Now, ketones are cool because they eat up fat, because fat breaks down and makes ketones. But the one thing that Dr. Atkins forgot was, hey, hello, it's neurotoxic. 
So if I have a diabetic patient, right, and they don't have a lot of glucose inside their system, it's all just floating around. So what do you think their body is going to make? It's going to make a whole bunch of ketones. Do either of you know anybody who's diabetic? Yeah. Yeah. Take a look at the way they eat. Every once in a while, doesn't, don't they like cough up their food or maybe the food falls out of their mouth or they drop a spoon or drop a fork or they're clumsy? You ever notice that? Or maybe there's speech slurs every once in a while. And, you're, and you know, and it goes, it's because they got a lot of ketones swirling around. Hence the term DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. My last DKA patient died on me, not even within an hour. Uh, she had uncontrolled diabetes and she only had a blood sugar of 200 milligrams per deciliter, which isn't too bad. My father had like 600 once, 800 once. And then she went into a coma because why? Not a lot of glucose inside the system where it belongs. So your body thinks you're starving. And if your body thinks you're starving, it's going to break down fat and make ketones. So if we see ketones in the urine, long story short, even though I made it an incredibly five minute long story, hopefully now, and also that's also the way you kind of have to remember things. You know, if you tell yourself a story or make up your own story, right? You, it goes, you'll remember it now. Hopefully you two will never forget that ketones are bad for you. And if I see them in my urine, that's no bueno situation. And especially if they're a uh, diabetic. So I will be wary of that. Okay. And now I told you a little story about white blood cells. I shouldn't see that either. But if I got a couple, eh, that's all right. One or two, but one or two white blood cells in a high powered field. eh, not a lot. Right. Uh, but uh, you got a UTI, you'll see like a hundred. So yeah, um, do, 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 do. and bilirubin also deals with um, metabolic things. And also bilirubin is uh, part of the reason why your urine is colored yellow or amber. Now, when your patient is more hydrated, of course, the urine will be lighter. But if they're dehydrated, not so good. And I totally remember after four days, uh, uh, four days of minimal water and whatnot. Oh, I remember, uh, I remember, uh, when we were back on base, no lie, my urine was almost brown and it, and it was nothing it, it, it came out with barely, barely 20 cc's. Uh, and it, it kind of scared me. Uh, and, and also I was only 18 at the time. So having oliguria or a uh, decreasing amount of urine, that's a problem. Having polyuria, too much urine, that's a problem. And if you get to the point of anuria or no urine, that is a signal of pending kidney failure. So um, part of your job as future nurses, you monitor the, uh, uh, the regular output of my patient. So who's most likely the person to see oliguria? Nursing staff. And you don't, you do not want to be the one to let it go down to uh, nothing. And the same thing with polyuria. Uh, you might have heard that um, diabetics have polyuria because they're usually dehydrated. They drink way too much. They eat way too much. And then what happens? You get polyuria, polyphagia, and then polydipsia, which is too much polyuria, too much urination, polydipsia, too much drinking polyphagia, too much eating. Because remember, a diabetic, the glucose is not inside the cell. It's floating around. So the body thinks that the gas tank is empty. It's the same analogy that I mentioned before that, you know, it's like going to the gas pump and pouring all the gas on top of your car, but not inside the gas tank where it belongs. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. So that's a nice chart. I could ask some really neat questions because uh, we talked about what? What's the property of urine? Well, this is what's in urine. I could ask the question, what's the pH of urine? Well, it could be slightly acidic, slightly basic. What's the normal odor of urine? Aromatic. Because what's the, uh, because what's the color? Well, it depends on my hydration status, right? Should I have glucose? Nope. Blood? Nope. 
ketones, nope. Protein, nope. White blood cells or leuco uh, and or leukocyte esterase, nope. So that's the kind of questions I could ask. Now, did you see what I just did right there? You know that physical characteristics are part of our goal for this particular uh, chapter. So you could sit and, at home and try to read all of this and just memorize it, which would be the wrong thing. Or you could ask yourself, what kind of questions can he ask? And then make yourself a little mini quiz and then quiz yourself. Okay. And that's the best way. Um, that's the, be uh, the best way. Another great way is called the Harvard method, which you read it and do and prepare it like you're the teacher. Okay. So if you were teaching somebody um, and it has dividends, especially if you have children, for example, um, my Chanel, which is my eldest daughter, uh, she's a nurse. Oh, what is wrong with this? She's a nurse. And I don't know why this does this. Maybe if I move it over. There you go. Well, she's a nurse. I never told her to be a nurse. I never told her. Well, now she wants to go to medical school, which is an entirely different ball of wax. But I never told her you know, you should be a doctor. You know, I didn't, I didn't do the typical, um, you know, Asian cultural thing that you're going to be a doctor no matter what. That's exactly uh, what my, what my parents did to, uh, did to me. Um, and you know, if you tell a kid A, they'll do B. Well, she, during medical school and during my residency, uh, that little girl, well, not so little anymore, she was my book holder. And she was my highlighter when she learned how to highlight. So imagine being in third grade, being exposed to all this science. So she fell in love with it. And is it, is it, was it a surprise that she became a nurse? Is it a surprise that she wants to be a physician? No, and I never told her. I actually told her the opposite, right? Uh, I actually told my, uh, my eldest son the opposite. Never be a Marine. Marines are the worst thing in the world. Get a loan for college just like everybody else. But if, if he saw the life and he saw how uh, other people are, so um, he picked up on it. So if you expose your child to certain things, they, uh, they will pick up on it. And it's the same thing for good things and for bad things. So let's look at who are the players in our neighborhood in the urinary system. Let's look at this right here. What is with my Mac today? It's being, being annoying. Okay, there you go, much better. Ah, okay. So you could see how your kidneys, which are located retroperitoneally, so you have the peritoneum, which protects your um, your abdominal cavity, all the stuff in your abdominal cavity. So whoever built us thought it was crazy important to protect these, so they put them behind the peritoneum. You'll also notice you have two kidneys, two ureters, one urinary bladder, and of course, your urethra down here. Your uh, right kidney is a little bit lower than your left kidney. Uh, can either of you guess why the right is lower than the left? Mm. What's a, what is a big thing on the right side of your body that may push this thing down? It's shaped like this. Your liver? Yeah, good, good, good. Even that, because next time, because... Uh, if you're going to be wrong, be wrong. Be loud and proud. Your liver, boom. <laughs> right? Because you do that in, uh, you do that in graduate school. Even if you're right, um, they'll say things like, uh, you know what? My watch was broken, but it was right twice today. Get to the back of the line, zero for the day. Because what are they doing? Not only the, they're, they're not only developing a thick skin for you, because like, uh, um, they want you to be able to convey confidence. There's going to be many times where you're going to feel so shaky in the ward. You're going to be like, 
oh my God, can I do this? There's going to be a lot of self-doubt. We don't need medical professionals who have self-doubt. And that's the reason why a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, they're, they come off as arrogant because many times we're human. Many times inside, I'm scared. I don't know if I'm saying the right thing. I'm not trying, but your patient is also scared. So they need to know that you're the confident one in the room. So next time someone asks you, say, yes, it's the liver. I believe it's the liver, right? And then goes, okay, you're correct. Or let's say you're wrong. Um, is it the spleen or gallbladder? He goes, I believe it's, a, I think the gallbladder might push it down. No, that's incorrect. And, then, you know, at least you, you know, you know what I'm saying? You stood your ground. So yes, you're correct. The liver's here. And it's going to push the right kidney a little bit lower than the left. You could also see on top of the kidney, you have your adrenal gland. And look, use your um, medical terminology, medical terminology powers, adrenal, al pertaining to add over or on top of your kidneys. And we'll talk about your adrenal glands um, when we talk about hormones. And you could see how they're intimately related to your, um, uh, to your blood. You have this huge inferior vena cava and you have your descending aorta here. And that's going to bring a lot of blood in and out of these kidneys. So these kidneys see the entire uh, five liters of your blood. Uh, we typically have around five liters for a typical 70 kilogram male. Uh, that's the archetypal, um, you know, um, measurement for a human being. Uh, but nowadays, of course, you have to know all, all things. But the main message is that these two kidneys, you could survive with one, but you should have two. And um, um, they see all your blood. So if they see all your blood, that means they're going to filter all of it. So as long as you have a heartbeat, you're going to be making urine. I used to play this game, and uh, please don't judge me on it, but, you know, of course you will. When I was a little kid, I was very like little as in like five or six years old, I was very amazed that if I pee, walk away from the toilet, like take a couple of steps, I could pee some more. And then I walk around the house and then I could pee some more. I was very inquisitive, like, like, like in a stupid way when I was a child. And the reason is, is as long as that, that blood flow is there, your kidneys will be filtering that blood and creating urine. Now, the urine goes uh, from the kidney, and we're going to talk about the star, the kidney momentarily. It goes into these ureters. Now, for diagram diagrammatic purposes, the ureters are exaggerated. In real life, they're as thin as this line, this black line right here. They're that thin. They're like 1.5 millimeter wide, some ridiculous number like that. It's very, very thin. And they're, um, uh, they're surrounded by muscle. And just like the way your esophagus pushes food down, the muscle inside the ureters through peristalsis, it pushes the urine down into right here, your urinary bladder, which is made out of transitional muscle. That means it can be very small, like as small as like a golf ball. And it can be big as, um, you know, you, you saw the capacity of urine. You can hold, um, uh, you can hold up to two liters. And then your urethra, which has a set of sphincters, which is circular muscle that acts like a valve. Your urethra then um, empties um, urine into the toilet, typically by, you know, your control. So your urethra, now, Who's going to always win? You can't hold in urine forever, but you can hold. A, and um, that's why little kids or uh, less than the age of four or five, they cannot control this neurologically. And of course, you know, when you get older, you won't be able to uh, control this uh, um, as well. I'm only in my 50s and I'm already at that stage where I have to get up in the middle of the night to go pee which uh, a year or two ago, I was like, are you kidding me, man? Because what happens? The urethra, the sphincters here, you, uh, and when you're, uh, when you're a toddler, you don't have control over it yet. But when you're, it goes, and when you get really, really old, right? Uh, especially if you have other ailments and other things or the neurologic, you won't be able to control this either, okay? 
So you have your ureters, two of them, urinary bladder, one of them, urethra, one of them. Now, this is looks like a male patient. Uh, like, well, well, the difference between the urethra within the male and female patient. Of course, the male patient has a penis, therefore the urethra is longer. And uh, the, the urethral orifice or, uh, um, you know, the meatus or hole that leads out to the outside world is relatively far away from uh, your anus. But in the female patient, the urethra is very short and relatively close uh, to your perineum, which is the area between your, uh, your vagina and your anus. So there is a greater potential for uh, a female patient to develop urinary tract infection. Now, it's, it's not uneven with the male patients. Their problem is their uh, UTI is typically asymptomatic. Which is not good, which is not a good thing to be. That means you could be walking around uh, having damage to your urethra and your urinary bladder and your ureters, and that's called a UTI, urinary tract infection. So if you're a male patient, you go to your urologist to go deal with that. If you're a female patient, you go to your gynecologist. But if that infection goes all the way up to your kidneys. That's a bad, bad situation. And then hence, we have to call the subspecialist, the nephrologist that comes into play. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the inside of the kidney, which we'll be doing um, uh, eventual, uh, like in week eight, we'll be dissecting a kidney and uh, looking at this live. So you got to look at the kidney, the internal structures. Where's the, in, where's, where's the external structures first? Oh, wait a minute. I'm using the wrong textbook. Silly me. But this is a nice textbook, though. I'll keep this open. Let's look, look at that momentarily. So let, go back to what I was talking about regarding the urethra. Vaginal canal. Urinary bladder, uh, this is your uh, female urethra. Look how short it is. Look at the urethral meatus in its relatively close proximity to the anus. But if you see here, male urethra, longer, right? And the urethral meatus here is much further away from the anus, right? So less likely. And it's no surprise that um, most UTIs are, um, the culprit is Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli, which is uh, which resides here in the rectum and in the anus, right? And you could see, um, you know, um, um, what was I going to mention? How much easier it is to get a UTI here, but there's going. This may be a more complicated case for a male patient because uh, uh, most likely they're asymptomatic. Urinary bladder, we talked about transitional epithelium, transitional muscle, that means it can be very small and it can get very, very big. And when it gets very, very big, that's when it starts squeezing, puts on pressure, and you could see the internal and external urethral sphincters. They are circular muscles that surround this and it helps close. So if you have like maybe a neurologic problem or a saddle injury, like uh, for motorcycles, you know, you saddle, you're riding on a motorcycle, or I don't know, someone hits you really, really hard in, in that horrible area of your body, then you could have a neurologic issue. And then um, uh, the nerve connecting to the sphincter could have a problem. And then my patient might urinate. Another complicating thing is also pregnancy, because in pregnancy, um, uh, these muscles get loosened up because uh, you know, there's baby in there and then muscles stretch. Uh, micturition is another word for urination. Voiding is another uh, word, right? And like I mentioned earlier, saddle injury, which is like an injury to your uh, sacral two, three, or four nerves that are right here. 
So if you have any sacral damage, like you broke the, the bottom part of your back or you maybe a uh, fractured part of your pelvis here and, and did, you could do, it can do damage. So it not only will give you urination problems, it'll also give you erectile dysfunction problems uh, uh, for the male patient. So I could ask, what is the nerve innervation for the urinary system? And you'll tell me your sacral nerves. And if you want to be super specific, S2, S3, S4. Uh, ureters, we already talked about. It's surrounded by muscle, surrounded by smooth muscle. You can't control it. That's why don't fight. If you got to pee, go pee. Don't fight it. I always, I always tell my babies that, but they're... They always want to just play. There's also a nice renal fat pad. We'll see that on bond dissection. It's a nice uh, area of cushioning. Another protective feature, other than it's locate the kidneys are located in the retroperitoneal area. Uh, whoever built us built us really smart with two floating ribs in the back uh, uh, to help us. Okay, let's go to internal anatomy. Where's the external? You know what? Let's just let's start. the The book wants internal. So again, how easy is it for us to take all of this, erase all of this, and go A B C D E F G? And that could be on your near exam, right? Because it's an anatomy exam. You have to be able to identify things. And I could use this diagram right here. So if you know there's an anatomy exam, and you got to go deal with it. Don't you think you should start looking at this? Now, it's a lot of stuff. So I like telling a story. It's a better way to remember things. So one classic question is external structures versus internal structures. So you see there are certain things that are coming from the outside world that are going into this inside world. And that part of the kidney, that dent, you know, that pushing inward uh, in the shape of the kidney is called your hilum. Um, and what's in the hilum? So if my kidney gets ripped out, I already know what's the problem. I'm going to have a renal vein problem. I'm going to have a renal artery problem. I'm going to have a renal nerve problem. And what's this big tube that's coming out here? That's your ureter. So if my kidney gets ripped out for whatever reason, I'm going to have four things that, that are going to be drastically affected. Renal artery, vein, and nerve. Now, that's easy to remember because wherever there's an artery, there's a vein. Wherever there's an artery and vein, there's also a nerve. Sometimes they call it in medicine, van, V-A-N, vein, artery, nerve. So you have a renal vein, artery, and nerve in the hilum. Does not look like a beautiful all of the above question? Hint, hint. And also in the hilum is exiting out is your ureter. So that screams a beautiful all of the above question. That also screams, oh, external structures that enter the hilum. When you look at your kidney, there's an outside section called your cortex. And you could see there's an inside section with all these like funnels. That's the best way to put it. Now the outside section is called your cortex. Dirty blood comes in through the renal artery, right? Comes in all through it here. And after it goes there, it gets filtered here in the cortex. And after this filtration process, we're gonna talk about it when we talk about the microscopic uh, things that are in the cortex it goes through these sets of funnels. Let's look at the funnel like a story. First, I visited the pyramids. Then I went into a minor calyx. Then I went into a major calyx. And then I ended up in the renal pelvis and then went down my ureter. Let's do that again. From my cortex where the uh, urine gets filtered out from my blood, I go, I, goes, I go into this first big funnel. And when you turn a pyramid upside down, what does it look like? Like a big funnel. Then you have the minor calyx, right? 
right here. Then you have the major calyx right here. All the major calyces then end up in the renal pelvis right here and then end up in the ureter. So knowing and understanding that, then I got all the uh, medullary structures. So think cortical structures, think arteries and veins and the nephron, which is the uh, functional unit of the kidney, all the microscopic nephrons. We're gonna talk about the nephron in a minute, but the medullary area, think what? All the funnels. So the pyramid, minor calyx, major calyx, urinary, uh, renal pelvis, which is behind all these structures. So when uh, my wife got a report of stones, stones in the medullary area, subpyramidal, uh, sub that means we was where? Down here. And when we read the report, it did not infiltrate minor or major calyces and no, I go, um, no other stone, stones were found in the renal pelvis or the ureter. So boom, now we know where the kid, now we know the stone is. But uh, uh, if you ever looked at kidney stones, they're not smooth, they're sharp. And if they go down here in this, this is an exaggerated tube. Remember, the tube is very, very thin uh, in real life. So just imagine a rock that looks more like a meteor with a lot of, uh, you know, sharp edges running down here and cutting everything up. You'll definitely have infection. You'll definitely have some blood in your urine and you'll have massive amounts of pain. Um, uh, a kidney stone is probably the only uh, the only uh, pathology that a male will ever know what it even remotely know what it's like giving childbirth. And I used to make that joke until my wife uh, got kidney stones uh, last year. And when I asked her pain level, she said eight out of 10. And I, uh, and I told her, that's what you said the first time you gave birth. And she was like, yeah, it's just as bad. And I'm like, Wow. And uh, my wife's a tough cookie. We have uh, five children and one adopted. So uh, for her to say it hurt, it hurt. And that's why I got my salt down. I get my fat down, get my blood pressure. I um, check my blood pressure because I don't want stones. I don't want that level of pain. Uh, and if that's the way you need to explain it to your patient, then, then do so. So I could ask you, I could have an arrow. What area is this? The outer area. And you'll say, oh, that's the cortex. What area is this with all the funnels? And that is your uh, medulla or medullary area. Medullary area should have urine. The cortical area should have blood. Makes sense. That's why when you start having blood leak into this, that means the nephron or the functional unit of the kidney that's in your cortex is not doing its job. So let's look at the nephron. It's microscopic. Let me see how many other. Uh, I keep on saying millions, but I think it's um, hundreds of thousands. Let me look it up because this is bothering me. How many nephrons are in each kidney? It's 250,000. Oh, anywhere from 200,000 to a million. Okay. So there's a lot of them. And they're microscopic. And you can see here, the blood part is in the cortex and the urine part, that's the medullary area or the medulla. That's in that other photo. It looks like, let's look at this. Okay, so blood comes in your renal artery and um, each one of these sections is called a lobe. So of course, in between the lobes, in between these pyramids is the interlobar uh, arteries. Then it arches over, hence the word arcuit, arc, which is like, you know, the arches, right? You can use, you know, it looks like McDonald's, right? So renal artery, segmental because it's into segments, interlobar, right? In between the lobes, arcuate, and it radiates out, hence the radial artery. Now it eventually is going to end up into these arterioles, 
They're very, very small. Now the arteriole will then get all coiled around and wrapped up in this thing called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is, they say it's a tuft of, of uh, capillaries. Now the capillary, if you recall, is only one cell thick. So the glomerulus is the area of filtration. So that's where the blood is going to get filtered out. And then whatever's excess, like water, salt, and whatnot, is going to end up here through this thing called the Bowman's capsule into your uh, uh, proximal convoluted tubule. Then it will go down here into the loop of Henle. Then in your distal convoluted tubule, and then ending out in your collecting duct. Let's go over that again. All throughout these arteries, the blood is dirty. It has things in it that I don't like, that I wanna get rid of. Not a lot, but it has some things. And also I wanna get rid of excess water if I need to. So it goes into this arterial, goes into these tuft of capillaries called your glomerulus, through your Bowman's capsule, convoluted, proximal convoluted tubule or your PCT, then your loop of Henle, then your distal convoluted tubule, and then into your collecting duct. So if you look at it kind of like a pathway and kind of like a story, first I went here, then I went here, then I went there, then it will make it easier for identification of things. Now, when all the blood gets filtered out, right? And you can see there's still a lot of uh, blood vessels that run throughout all of this part. And just like I stated before, it's part of the cortex, so that's important. The clean blood will now go into these uh, venules. And from the venules, it'll go back the same way it came. And it's gonna end up in your renal vein. And then where? Back out in your blood, nice and clean. And that, so that's the first function of your kidney. Now, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, they're a really good filter but it's not the best filter. It's not 100%. You know, it has some faults. So sometimes it throws out things that we don't mean to throw out. Let's say, for example, the glomerulus throws out some glucose. Ah, I threw out glucose by accident. My bad. Well, you see all these, um, uh, these arterioles here? Well, there's something called reabsorption. Your kidneys sense that I accidentally threw out something that I shouldn't have thrown out. So I'm going to reabsorb it so it can go back into the system. So that's another function. You have filtration and then reabsorption. Now, let's say, uh, uh, let's say that I forgot to throw out something like salt. I had excess sodium. Now the sodium is already going out of the glomerulus, right? So my kidney goes, wait a minute, we gotta throw out more salt. That's called secretion. Throwing out something that you should have thrown out but you forgot. So let's write that down. There are three major components to what the nephron or the functional unit of a kidney does. Nephron is also known as the functional unit of the kidney. Of course, it's located in the cortical area of your kidney. Most of it is blood. And function one, of course, filtration at the level of uh, the glomerules. So if my patient has glomerulonephritis, what can't they do? They can't filter the blood. That's a no bueno situation. Function two, since this filtration isn't 100%, we have reabsorption. So that's when I take in something that I was supposed to throw out. So re means to go back. I want to go back and absorb something good that I accidentally throw out. And the third function, Secretion, I forgot to throw something out or I need to throw something out now. Uh, one example is salt, I wanna control my blood pressure. 
so I could secrete stuff. So your kidney not only filtrates blood, it can reabsorb products and it can secrete products. All of this is done in the cortical area of the kidney. Uh, and uh, um, um, in the and in that area, there's anywhere from 200,000 to a million nephrons or functional units of the kidney. Let's look at, oh, here is the bigger, badder, better picture. Let's retrace our steps. From arterial to your glomerulus, through the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, H-E-N-L-E, -E, distal convoluted tubule, then con connecting duct, connecting duct, and it'll go into uh, the pyramids in your medullary area. At the area of the glomerulus, filtration, and then all throughout here is uh, absorption, reabsorption, and secretion. Okay? That's the worst I'll do to you. I can erase these, and then uh, you can identify. And of course, if it's blue, it's venous blood, deoxygenated. If it's red, it's oxygenated blood. Let us now look at, so do you think you can go home? Do this to yourself. Hello, this is what I would, this is what I do. All I do is I'll take this A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So which of the following numbers filters my blood? Anybody? Which, which filters the blood? Five. Uh, oh, which is the loop of Henley? Number four. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Where's the collecting duct? Number nine. Where's the Bowman's capsule? Number six. Where's the proximal convoluted tubule? Number seven. Where's the distal convoluted tubule? Number eight. I won't be so picky to ask like uh, number one and number two, but you could easily do this at home uh, or take this photo that we had up here uh, for, for uh, this particular chapter and then do what? Um, make your own little quiz, quiz yourself and that's, that's the better way to study instead of just trying to memorize it. Because when you do that, you can focus on the ones you got wrong. Here's a closer version of what happens in the glomerulus. And in the glomerulus, we're gonna be talking about JG cells or juxtaglomerular cells. They play a big role in um, um, homeostasis for hypertension or for your blood pressure. And juxta means on top of, right on top of what? Your glomerulus. They're called JG cells. Proximal, tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule. Let's now talk about loop of Henley. Oh, talked about G, GFR. Um, what's GFR? Glomerular filtration rate. Now, GFR is one of those blood tests where uh, we want to know uh, how much blood is running through your glomerulus. And it's an indication of, uh, of uh, uh, kidney health on how well your uh, blood is flowing through your kidney. And eventually you're going to have to know pressures, but not now. But you can see now, right, going from a high area of concentration to a low. 55 millimeters um, uh, mercury. And then of course this is 10 millimeters. So things are gonna go this way. And you could see also blood, well, I, I'm not, I don't wanna get into it, why it's going in the opposite direction. But just know this is your glomerulus. 
This is your Bowman's capsule and there's pressure going this way so that anything that gets filtered is gonna go straight down this way. And you can see here, so those of you who are not good at math, get good at math because there are mathematical questions on your future NCLEX. But it's not so bad. I didn't think the math was, uh, math was that bad. Um, what are some things that the, uh, the body reabsorbs? Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarb, water, right? What are some things that it throws out? Because man, I should have threw it out. Urea, which is a waste product. Uric acid, creatine, creatinine, which is a byproduct of uh, um, breakdown of uh, muscle, right? I also, another thing that your kidneys also can control is your pH. You see, H plus, hydrogen ion can be thrown out. And if I throw out hydrogen ion, I am pushing uh, the pH more towards uh, um, alkaline or more towards the middle. And also uh, potassium is also related to that as well. I could either bring in water or I could take out water. Now, if you notice the loop of Henle, there is a descending part and there is an ascending part. This is where it creates something called um, the countercurrent. Uh, which you'll learn more about when you're in your pathology class. But for at this level, understand that the descending part only takes in water. The ascending part uh, throws out sodium, potassium, and chlorine uh, chloride, which are salts. So descending, it's going to reabsorb water. Ascending limb of your uh, loop of Henle, will uh, reabsorb salts, okay? And it does that for a reason. Let's see if they'll show it. So when it, let's look at, Here's a nice video. Oh, here, Khan Academy. So let's look at this. As you can see, I watched it before. What the countercurrent, what they call the countercurrent multiplication in the kidney on why does it absorb, reabsorb water only on one side? And why does it reabsorb salts on the other side? And there's a reason to it. And this is the reason. Anything that is not the tubule or vessels, and that's just space nephron that we're going to talk about. So it's pretty important. Where does the nephron go next? Well, it they go here, the and then there's a part we call the renal medulla, which is down. On the other hand, the ascending limb does the exact opposite. Here, we reabsorb things. Okay, so this is the, we already know what all this is. Okay, we already know about reabsorption. And we already know about uh, secretion. So uh, I'm going to get to this part of the video where it talks about how the loop of Henle creates an atmosphere where water comes in this way and salts go out that way. And it's to control the amount of water and the amount of salt. So water and salt balance or water and salt homeostasis. Things. The descending limb reabsorbs water. So we have mainly water come in here. And in fact, there are no ions that are reabsorbed at this point. It is impermeable to ions. On the other hand, the ascending limb does the exact opposite. Here, we reabsorb things like sodium, chloride, potassium. And in fact, this part is impermeable to water. No water will be reabsorbed here in the ascending limb. And because of this, we have a very beautiful system that occurs as a result. This is called countercurrent multiplication. Countercurrent multiplication, which is also, I'll admit, a mouthful, but it completely makes sense, I promise. 
countercurrent multiplication. We say countercurrent because the descending limb and the ascending limb go in opposite directions. That's why it's countercurrent. Multiplication means that when we reabsorb ions in the ascending limb here and make the medulla salty by not reabsorbing water, that drives water to be reabsorbed passively in the descending limb. And we have a video that goes into detail about transport processes in the nephron. But here, just remember that water is reabsorbed passively. So no energy is expended to reabsorb water. And this is because we have used energy here in the ascending limb to reabsorb these ions. So active transport is used here. And by actively pumping ions into the medulla, and no water in the ascending limb to make it salty, we can multiply the amount of water that is reabsorbed passively because it's driven into this space around the tubule or the nephron. The space around the tubule is just called interstitium. I'll write that off right here. So this is the interstitium. This is anything that is not the tubule or vessels, and that's just space around here. This is all just interstitium, just hanging out right here. And so all this ions that are reabsorbed into the medullary interstitium down here, the interstitium of the medulla, drive the passive reabsorption of water. All right, so I think we have a pretty good understanding of the loop of Henle and the countercurrent multiplication process that happens here. The next part of the nephron is this guy that kind of loops back and just right. kisses. So the thing that we need to know is in the descending limb, the only thing that gets reabsorbed is water. In the ascending limb, the only thing that gets reabsorbed are salts, sodium, chloride, and potassium. Sodium, chloride, and potassium require ATP. That means it's active. There's got to be a pump that pumps this thing in. It's called a countercurrent multiplier because the deeper you go in the loop of Henle, the more water gets passively. So water is passive, meaning it doesn't take any energy to bring the water in. But we're kind of tricking the kidney to bring water in by moving the salt out of the ascending limb. And uh, that's pretty clever uh, because it expends much less energy than it would to try to just move water. And that is the reason why you should know what diffusion means. Uh, you should know what osmosis means. You should know osmolarity. You should pay attention when you're in your biochem class. All these other courses all relate to each other. And now you could see here, it goes, the loop of Henle is key regarding water and salt. And that's actually how we manage blood pressure, water and salt. That's why we give you uh, medications that limit your salt. That's why we tell you don't eat salt in your diet. The patient... If the patient has hypertension, we automatically put them on a, a low sodium diet immediately. Uh, how do you think water pills or diuretics work? It messes with this. Okay. So that's your counter current multiplier. And that happens at the loop of Henle. So think that looks like a beautiful both A and B question. It looks like a beautiful specific question regarding the descending limb. A beautiful specific question regarding the ascending limb. Doesn't this look like a, a awesome all of the above question? Active versus passive question. So right off the bat, just looking at this picture, so many things that, or I could ask, where's the location of your uh, countercurrent multiplier? And you will point at the loop of Henley. Won't point anywhere else. So that's what gets created. And you can see here, see the hydrogen and the sodium? It gets moved through ATP. That means it is, uh, it is uh, active. It requires energy. But the neat part of this system is, you see what happens? The osmolality gets what? Higher, hence the term multiplier. So osmolality means how much solute or how much, um, how much uh, salts are in it. So near the top part here, there's less. But as we get deeper and deeper and deeper, right, more salt is here. And if there's more salt here, then it's going to push more water in. Hence the term and 
counter current multiplier. You have on one side water and on the other side salt, right? And it gets deeper. And a typical NCLEX question would be like at the distal portion of uh, at the distal portion, what would most likely be the osmolarity? Would it be 100, 600, 300? But know that if it's at the bottom, it's going to be a bigger number. At the top, it's going to be a smaller number. But for my exam, all I need for you to know is, do you know what the loop of Henle is? Do you know uh, the descending limb? Do you know the ascending limb? Do you know what gets absorbed in the descending limb? What gets uh, reabsorbed in the ascending limb? And if you could get that, you should be fine. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Let's see, what's next? We already talked about the nerves. S2 through S4. Ah, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Let us talk about that. And the best way to do it is this diagram. Where are you? This one. This is my favorite diagram because instead instead of reading it has and doesn't it look like a concept map what i don't want to i want this this instead of doing a concept map right this is a different version of a concept map called the flow chart how things flow now so many pieces to this you can look at it in so many pieces but whenever you have something that's a little bit daunting and it's got a lot of pieces in it well what can i do I could look at it in sections. So can we all agree that this is one section? This is another section. And this is another section. So we're going to look at it in three parts. So a reflex doesn't require the brain. You need a sensory part, and that's this part. You got to sense something. Well, the impetus or the starting point of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is my patient has a decrease in blood pressure. Now, of course, decreased blood pressure, what does that mean? I'm either dehydrated, I don't have a lot of sodium, and I don't have a lot of water or blood, or I'm bleeding out. Can we all agree to that? That that makes sense. If I'm dehydrated, if I have a sodium deficiency, or I'm bleeding, that means I'll have a decrease of blood volume, decrease of blood pressure. Don't you think you can learn that as just one big story? Okay, so that's one section. So when that happens, decrease in blood pressure for any reason, the JG cells get activated and we already know the juxtaglomerial cells. You know what, this is annoying. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna put it in a lovely picture. And there you go, so I can now point at stuff. So the JG cells, we already know what they are, the juxtaglomerial cells. They're inside, um, they're on top of my uh, nephron, which is in the cortical area of my kidneys. So JG cells are gonna release renin. Now I have a picture of a liver here, right? And the liver is gonna release angiotensinogen. Now, anytime you see ten ogen like that, that means it's a precursor. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a converting enzyme. It's a precursor to something else. So renin gets uh, transformed into angiotensin one. And who deals with that? Angiotensinogen. I have a decrease in blood pressure. Look at this medical term. Angio means blood vessel. Tense means you know. Um, you know, uh, to constrict or to make tight. So what are we doing? We want to try to increase blood pressure. So my liver will uh, release angiotensinogen. The renin will turn into angiotensin one. It gets converted to angiotensin two by something called ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme. That makes sense. One goes to two. And that's the second part. So I could ask you questions. Where are the JG cells located? And you'll tell me, well, my kidney. 
Where do I get angiotensinogen from? I close my eyes. Do you see there's a liver? Right? Where did I get renin from? I close my eyes. I got it from a kidney because that's the arrow. Angiotensinogen is right next to renin. So it's going to turn angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And I have what? A kidney here on the left. And it says ACE. You can see now how it's a picture that's worth a thousand words. And how's this? How about every morning you take five minutes and see if you can draw each section? You know, like I draw a little kidney, draw a little liver. Doesn't have to be the best thing, but you physically drawing it out. Don't you think that'll get into your longer term memory? And it's yes. The answer is yes. So those are the kind of questions that could come out there. Now, what's going to happen? Angiotensin. I have to tense things up. So, of course, there's going to be vasoconstriction of all my arter arterioles and, of course, blood pressure. But what else? I'm thinking arteries. And look at this adrenal cortex. It looks like an A, adrenal cortex. So it's going to re release another A, aldosterone. So what's going to happen? Increase of potassium, increase of, uh, of uh, hydrogen ion into urine. And then what's it going to do for me? Increase the blood volume. So there's two things. I'm going to constrict and I'm going to increase blood volume. What's going to happen in those two situations? My blood pressure will increase. So I could have a question. What does the adrenal cortex release? A, adrenal cortex, A, aldosterone. What happens to aldosterone? Increase of what? K and H. K is potassium. H is uh, um, hydrogen ion. And what's our ultimate goal? And my blood pressure is going to increase. So what are two ways to increase blood pressure? I either constrict the arterioles or I increase the blood volume. Now, let's do things backwards. My patient has high blood pressure. What are the two things I mess with to get that blood pressure down? I tell the arterioles, hey, stop squeezing. Or I give you a water pill that will do what? Throw out those salts that we talked about. So it decreases my blood volume, therefore decreasing my blood pressure. Oh, by the way, have you guys heard of um, ACE inhibitor? That's an antihypertension drug. If I have an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin 1 can't go to angiotensin 2. And then that happens, this gets blocked. If this gets blocked, I can't constrict my arterioles. I put a beta blocker here, can't constrict my arterioles. And how do diuretics work? By throwing out salts like potassium and hydrogen ion and sodium. I throw that out. Or how's this? Why do I have to have a low sodium diet? Because if I don't have enough sodium in my system, it won't tell my blood pressure to go up. So you can see now how knowing a diagram like this, you can answer pharmacology questions, med surge questions, anatomy questions, physiology questions all day, every day. And did we have to read a single paragraph? Nope. So doing your, um, even though it seems awkward and complex now, doing your concept maps will help you start thinking like this. And do you think I just gave away a lot of my exam questions? Yeah, when you look at the, um, uh, when you look at the practice exam, the, the simple answer is yes. Okay, so uh, let's, let's start from the very beginning, just one more time, okay? What do we start out with? Increase or decrease? Decrease of blood pressure. What are some examples of decrease of blood pressure? Decrease blood volume or dehydration, I don't have a lot of water and I don't have a lot of salt. Or I'm bleeding out because someone, someone uh, you know, uh, cut open my wrists or something. That's a morbid thing to say, but you know, I'm just an example. JG cells increases renin, liver releases angiotensinogen, which will um, uh, then increase your angiotensin one. One turns into two because of angiotensin converting enzyme that's in my lung. What will happen? Increase vasoconstriction, activate the adrenal cortex to increase aldosterone, potassium, I go and um, uh, hydrogen ion go out of the urine. I go, go into the urine. And then what happens? More salt into the urine, increase the blood volume, 
increased blood pressure. Does anyone have a, any questions on this or how I could, uh, how I could ask a question on an exam? No. It seems a little bit complex, but practice it a couple of times and, and practice it daily. Practice everything that you do daily. And the next thing you know, it becomes uh, old hat. Here's another exercise as well. You look at it and study it, then close your eyes. Look at it and study it. Try to write it down on a scrap piece of paper and then start combining things that you already know, okay? Uh, like I'm not a very good artist, but if I drew it myself, I'll remember it. Actually, when I drew this, I, I'll, doesn't this look like a J? That's how I see it. And ACE, uh, I see I see lungs and it says ACE in it. That's why forever I will always know angiotensin converting enzyme is in your lung. So if my patient has a lung problem, don't you think they're going to have a blood pressure problem? Yeah. And that's what, when you study pathology, that's where you have to use your anatomy and physiology to start making the connections. Don't you think if I have a liver problem, I'm also going to have a blood pressure problem. If I have a kidney problem, I'm definitely going to have a blood pressure problem. So you can see how all of this works, right? If I'm taking corticosteroids that affect my adrenal cortex, right? Or if I'm taking uh, um, you know, illicit steroids because I want to bulk up and I want to look huge, it's going to kill this. And it's going to do a number on my blood pressure, which it does. And if I do a number on my blood pressure, what's else it going to do? It's going to mess up my heart. It's going to mess up other things, right? So uh, remember, even though we study it in a separate uh, venue, um, all these things are related. And I'll make this uh, chart available for you guys. Let, let me uh, save it. And then uh, R-A-A. -A. Right. This is a lovely thing to know because it not only involves anatomy, physiology, endocrinology, med surge. That's why um, if ever, I wish I saved my notes in medical school. All of it was like this, arrows and stupid little drawings, all these things to try to make me remember things. And the most important part was when you need, when you need it and you grab it from your brain at the moment you need it, that's a pretty neat thing. Let's look at our, um, uh, our objectives to see, did we meet all our objectives? Let us see. So, did we talk about the property of urine? Check. How does urine move around and end up in the toilet? Check. Structure and function of kidney? Check. Uh, the, 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 the RAA system? Oh, by the way, don't watch this video. This video is so confusing. Um, uh, I like my diagram better, but again, watch it. Maybe you might like it. This urinary physiology lab has a lot of neat little notes in it. So did we talk about urinary system structure and function? Yes. Kidney structure and function? Yes. Endocrine regulation of kidney function via the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Yes. So I think that's everything for this particular day. Oh, I forgot. Buffer. Uh, let's go back to our chart. This is since since this guy mentioned, I never watched the video, by the way. Uh, let's go back to the chart. Oops, not this chart. Now we talked about the hydrogen ion, right? And we know that's acidity, right? So can my kidneys also control how acid my system is? Yeah. Because right here, it's mentioned right here, how your kidneys or how your renal system controls hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrogen ion. So if you have too much hydrogen ion in your system, you're acidic. If you don't have much hydrogen ion in your system, you're basic or alkaline. And your kidney, to add to all the other things that the kidney does, um, it monitors... Uh, um, Acid base homeostasis. Another thing that it also monitors is blood volume. The kidneys see all your blood all day, every day. 
So if you're short a pint, um, it signals, um, uh, it sends the erythropoietin, which is the uh, hormone that signals your bones, hey, go make some more red blood cells. We're short. And your kidneys does that well. So now knowing all of that, you now know how crucial your kidneys are. Then why in heaven's name do most Americans ignore it? Why, why does it take the National Kidney Foundation to... Uh, um, uh, to beg, borrow, and steal every year, uh, especially for diabetics. Um, diabetic kidney is the most preventable cause of death. My father died of it, right? And if I don't be careful, I'm going to die of it because now I'm pre-diabetic, but I'm going to be like my mom. I'm going to stay pre-diabetic till the end of my days. I will never cross that threshold because I know how anatomy and physiology works. And hopefully you will as well. So do we have any questions on how the exam will go? What kind of questions do you want some? I guess I'll be putting practice questions in the form of an old exam uh, that I had. Are we good? Yeah. Call it a day? Yeah. All righty. So rewatch this video, rewatch the other videos, look at your objectives and then ask yourself when you look at your, um, um, what do you call that? If you look at your concept maps, what's important? Now I know what's important. How will he ask that question? And then, you, and you guys are smart cookies. You can figure it out. And, go, and right now I gave you some examples and probably maybe too many examples on how I could ask questions on this as well. So with that being said, kindly log off to connote that you have no more questions. And I'll see you guys, uh, well, hopefully you'll be uh, next week, Wednesday, September 1 at 9 a.m. Hopefully you'll uh, be logging in and I'll see it. And again, uh, my contact information, let me go reiterate that for this video because uh, you know, in the heat of a moment, you might forget if you look here, contact information here, I'll be monitoring my cell phone that morning. I'll be monitoring email, but no Zoom. And then to reiterate, what's due today, task three, discussion three, lesson three, what's due next week, only task four. Do not do discussion four. Do not do lesson four. That is where I'm going to put your midterm grade, uh, a midterm exam grade, I mean, okay? So for all good ladies, have a good one and I'll see you online next week. Kindly log off to connote that you have no questions and we're all good. I want to ask. Shoot, let, let me get this off.